welcome. We are thrilled to have all of you here. Shh, shh. No, clearly don't yell loud enough. We're thrilled to have all of you here at the third annual um, Chicago Legal Legends Luncheon. Um, and I couldn't be, my name is Lisa Brown, I'm the executive director of ACS, and I could not be um, more thrilled to be here today to honor the terrific group of legends that you're, you all know um, immensely well already and we'll be hearing more about today. Colleen Connell, Judge James Moran, Judge Alana Rovner, Lowell Sacknoff, and Thomas Sullivan, I would say are role models not just for lawyers in Chicago, but actually all around the country. So welcome to honorees, congratulations. We're thrilled to have you here. Um, we are also thrilled and very honored to have both Senator Dick Durbin and Lieutenant Governor Pat O'Quinn speaking with us today. Um, I feel as though this is an embarrassment of riches for us and we're really excited. Um, Senator Durbin got stuck um, on a vote and is gonna be coming in I think around one o'clock. So we apologize if there are any slight disruptions to the program from that. Um, I wanna say a huge thank you to the Chicago Lawyer Chapter, to its board, to the host committee for this lunch. Um, the Tremendous strength of this chapter is best summed up in the fact that it won the Lawyer Chapter of the Year Award at our 2007 annual convention, which gives you a sense of the breadth of the chapter and their fabulous work. Um, and I would be remiss if I did not single out the president of the chapter, um, Amy Gardner, who, yeah, I would say the Star Wars-like force behind the chapter. Um, uh, and also, I would like to mention the other people that were instrumental in organizing this year's luncheon. Um, Jack Tice, Judge Peter Flynn, Megan Pitts, Jamie Stevens, Barry Sullivan, Ron Miller, and Steve Sanders, without whom none of this would be taking place. Um, in the interest of having lunch end before dinner, I encourage you to look in your programs for the full list of board members and host committee, because they are all in your program. Um, I do, however, want to say a personal thank you to the sponsors of the chapter, because without all of you, um, we wouldn't be able to do what we do all the time. And that's Hugh Sokol, Jenner and Block, Levin and Perconti, Mayor Brown, Miller, Shackman and Beam, Sidley Austin, and Skadden Arps. Um, thank you from the bottom of um, my heart for your support of the chapter. Um, most importantly, thank all of you for coming today. Um, it's wonderful to see so many judges, past honorees, um, and very distinguished lawyers and friends um, who are here. And um, I apologize, it looks like I must have um, not said Quinn earlier, Lieutenant Governor and I, oh, he just came in, welcome. Thank you, I thought I'd mispronounced your name or something when I was handed that, so. Welcome, we're honored to have you here. Um, when I, I spoke to you a year, one of the most fun things for me about this job is actually coming year after year to this lunch. And when I spoke to you last year, um, I spoke about the hunger for ACS and a really strong response to the dominant conservative movement. And I have to say in many ways it is, it's only more true today when you look at the price, sort of what's happened just over the past year, the price our country's paid for straying from our founding values of liberty, justice, equality, and the rule of law. I, who would have imagined that Brown v. Board of Education, the seminal case striking down segregation would get turned on its head to strike a blow at integration? That politics would trump the rule of law at our own Justice Department that our government would torture people in our name and our CIA would be under investigation for destroying tapes of surveillance. But the opportunities um, before us to change all this right now are tangible to say the least, and I know that is felt particularly strongly here in Chicago. Um, and as we end a primary season that has re-engaged people, young and old, all over this country, everybody's thinking about the future. And I think they're, everybody's thinking about it with excitement. Um, and you know, our founders recognized that freedom, justice, and equality weren't gonna be handed to us by those in power, that it was something that we were consistently gonna have to fight for. And that is part of what ACS is all about, and that is why we're here. Um, we wanna make sure that your voices help shape the face of our democracy this year, next year, and in the many years to come. 
ACS is a potent voice and growing resource of ideas and person power for those who are working to build a better future at the local, state, and national level. Our strength stems first from the power of our ideas um, and second from the vibrant network of progressives that we are building all across the country. Um, through our high profile national programs, which includes our annual convention, which is taking place next week, I hope to see many of you there, our annual Supreme Court review at the National Press Club, um, briefings for the press, briefings for Capitol Hill, we are giving new ideas to decision makers and opinion leaders on the national level. Um, equally important are the over 1,000 programs a year that we host like this one all around the country. Um, we have 164 student chapters and 30 lawyer chapters now around the country which host spectacular programs and fo focusing attention, local attention on issues of importance on the local and national level and building vibrant local networks which are a key to this organization. We are generating and publicizing compelling ideas through our working groups and our publications. We now have eight working groups on issues ranging from voting in democracy to economic and environmental regulation, from access to justice to separation of powers. And now a variety of publications, including the official ACS journal, which is the Harvard Law and Policy Review, Advance, which is the journal of the ACS issue groups, and ACS blog. Um, not surprisingly, a major focus of our work this year, but hardly the only one, is identifying priorities for the next administration in the areas of law and justice. On the heels of the torture memo and stories about the politicization of the Department of Justice, the public will rightfully be asking what a new president and a new attorney general will do to make sure that departmental policies on issues ranging from counterterrorism to civil rights to criminal enforcement are impartial, principled and based on the rule of law. And we will be publishing a series of papers later on this year that will help to answer that very question. So as you all know, there's an awful lot of work to do, um, and we are committed to being a growing resource for lawyers, judges, policymakers, and the press on the federal and state level, in short, for all of you. Uh, so please, if you're not yet a, an active member of ACS in the Chicago chapter, please become one. There are membership brochures on your table. We are working to connect you all, both with our programmatic work and with our network around the country, so that you have access to important ideas and people and can keep the energy of this election season going by remaining active participants in our democracy. In our democracy, people are policy, and that is especially true of lawyers. Real change is going to require far more than one election. Uh, if we are to, share, to achieve our shared vision of a just society, all of us have to participate personally in the public debates of today, tomorrow, and the many years to come. That's what ACS is all about. And if there is one person who understands this, uh, it is Ruth Goldman, who I'm excited is here with us today. And she's a special friend to ACS and to, I think, the entire um, progressive community in Chicago. And I have the distinct and wonderful honor of announcing the Ruth Goldman Award, which is established this year. The Ruth Goldman Award honors a woman in the Chicago legal community who has made significant contributions to advance the status of women in the legal profession and the goals of ACS. Ruth has always been an ardent supporter of constitutional rights and progressive causes, but she has not simply voiced her beliefs, she has lived them. When I think of Ruth, the phrase, just do it, comes to mind. And yes, she should have been in a Nike ad, but she never would have permitted it, I think, because she does what she does in such an understated way. Ruth has been a pathbreaker, leader, and mentor for women lawyers, but her approach has been free of rhetoric and histrionics. She just did it. She was one of only six women in her law school class at the University of Chicago, where she met her beloved husband, Hal, where she typed, I will say, not only her own papers, but also her husband's, which apparently led um, Harry Calvin, when he learned that they were getting married, to say that he knew they would get along because they made the same typos. <laughs> When Ruth graduated in 1947, uh, she couldn't get a job at the law firm here in Chicago and went to work for several years for the legal aid department of the Jewish Family and Community Service. Um, she then had four adored and adoring children um, who, along with her grandchildren, continued to be the light of her life. 
Three of her children are with us today, Debbie, Fran, and Rick. Is that right? I, and we're thrilled to have you here. Thank you. Um, when Ruth was ready to return to her profession in 1968, at age 46, she began part to work part-time at the firm that was then DeVoe, Shader, Mikva, and Krupp, now Miller, Shackman, and Beam. One of her very first assignments, in fact, possibly her very first, um, was to help in the firm's representation of no less a client than Playboy. And she was sent to Playboy's offices where she noticed that all the younger women in the office were wearing much shorter skirts than she was. Um, unfazed, she walked into the bathroom, rolled up her skirt several times around the middle um, so that she would be more au courant in the office. And I have to say that spirit of curiosity, of enthusiasm, and engagement in the world and with the people around her um, is what really emblemizes Ruth to me. And I think it's part of why everybody loves her so much and respects her so much. Um, women who followed Ruth at the firm describe her as a role model because she led by example, balancing work, family, and community commitments long before anybody coined the phrase work-family balance or wrote all the gazillion books advising us how we should be striking that balance. She was the first, I believe, both the first woman partner at the firm and the first person to be made partner who was working part-time when she became partner, perhaps even the first person in Chicago to make partner as if somebody was working part time. And this had a huge impact on the other, on, uh, particularly on the other women in the firm. Um, and simply by just doing it, she created opportunities for generations of women after her, opportunities that the rest of us now take for granted. Living her beliefs extended to her community engagement. Ruth feels passionately about issues and has been instrumental to the development and impact of a number of organizations that are committed to making our country live up to its ideals of justice, equality, and democracy. She was actively involved with the League of Women Voters educational effort, an early, early supporter of EMILY's list, and as probably all of you know, pivotal in the founding of the Chicago Lawyer Chapter in the, and in the establishment of this lunch. And I think she also gets the record of attendance at ACS events, I've, which is terrific for me. Um, as with her professional career, she did all this um, just did it with no fanfare, not for desire for personal attention, but because she cared about what she was supporting. Ruth is someone who just doesn't see barriers. Where others see obstacles and reasons for not doing something, she just does it. Whether it was forging a path for women in the law, hiking in Nepal at age 70, for which she trained by walking up 12 flights of stairs at her law firm while much younger associates took the elevator, um, helping to found ACS in the face of conservative dominance or battling cancer with optimistic determination, Ruth has led the way for all of us and set an example for how all of us should live our lives. Ruth, I know you are embarrassed by this award, but it's important to the rest of us to recognize you and the opportunities that you have created for all of us. So thank you for letting us do this for you. And I now am honored to give the first Ruth Goldman Award to Colleen Connell. Um, like Ruth, Colleen lives her values and is both an engaged mother with a terrific family and a highly respected professional. As the executive director of the ACLU of Illinois, Colleen spends her life working to improve the lives of others and particularly those who have little or no voice in our society. To say that Colleen is firmly committed to civil rights, civil liberties, and women's issues is an understatement. It seems to be in her blood. She's well known for her willingness to speak out forcefully on matters of right and wrong. And I think her commitment may be summed up um, in one single fact, which is that she chose to name her son Brennan after the late Justice Brennan. <laughs> Uh, before becoming executive director, she was the ACLU's uh, associate legal director and director of the Reproductive Rights Project, where she directed litigation efforts involving constitutional rights of privacy and fought to protect the right of Illinois citizens to make decisions concerning reproductive matters and childbearing with, without undue government intrusion. 
She's also litigated a wide variety of other cases on issues ranging from rights of the mentally ill to equal access to education to discrimination, including representing women barred from jobs at the Metropolitan Sanitary District and flight attendants who were forced to leave their jobs when they got married. It seems like a long time ago, but... Like Ruth, Colleen has led by example. Her highly respected leadership as the first woman to head the Illinois office of the ACLU has advanced the role of women in the legal profession, while her work in the areas of reproductive rights and access to basic women's health care has advanced the role of women in our society more generally. Like Ruth, Colleen lives her beliefs and the values at the core of ACS's mission, human dignity, justice, and equality, and has created a world with far more opportunities, not just for women, but for all of us. Colleen. Thank you. It's truly an honor to receive the first ever Ruth Goldman Award. And I'm sure it was obvious from Lisa's introduction of Ruth that the real recipient of the Ruth Goldman Award really should be Ruth because she has truly been an inspiration and a role model for all of us. So thank you, Ruth. This is a huge honor for me and it's a privilege to get it in your name. I am so appreciative. I want to just speak briefly about what I think binds all of us together. The first enumerated purpose of the Constitution is to establish justice. Ruth Goldman's career embodies a personal commitment to establishing justice. She led the way as a woman, as a lawyer, and as an intellectual to embracing this century and last century's challenge of extending the promise of the Constitution to everyone, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, income, national origin, or whatever other marginalized or minority or disadvantaged person might have been. We, however, unfortunately today are living in a time when too many government leaders and too many lawyers seem to believe that the sole purpose of providing for the common defense is the only constitutional value worth protecting. It is a privilege to accept an award from the American Constitution Society, which clearly believes that there are so many other constitutional values that it embodies and that are worth defending. Tragically, the Constitution's most profound contributions to individual liberty and the rule of law have been casualties of the Bush administration. It is a period of history that we one day will mark with shame for tolerating detentions without any kind of process, let alone due process of law, for acquiescing in torture, for acquiescing in warrantless wiretapping and spying, and for grandiose, lawless, and evil assertion of unchecked presidential authority. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King reminded us that the arc of history, although long, bends toward justice. We must remain vigilant and steadfast in our commitment to restore the Constitution and the rule of law. Righting those grievous constitutional and human wrongs of the Bush administration will not happen simply because this administration ends. It is up to us, the American Constitution Society, and all of us to remain vigilant in our commitment to the Constitution and using it to serve and to achieve justice. On behalf of the ACLU, where I've been privileged to work for almost a quarter of a century, thank you, Ruth and the American Constitutional Society, for honoring me with this award. It's truly important. Thank you. Please enjoy your lunch, and we'll be back with you in a little while.
And in the interest of letting you all do a little bit of work this afternoon, um, I would, Senator Durbin has joined us. We're honored to now have him with us. And it is my honor to introduce someone who truly in this group really does need no introduction as the senior senator from Illinois and majority whip. Um, but I, I am going to take the moderator's privilege of saying a few things. Um, and in 2006, Time Magazine named Senator Durbin as one of America's 10 best senators, citing his skill at debate. And I quote, um, even though the Senate is occasionally dubbed the world's greatest deliberative body, actual debate on the Senate floor rarely happens. Members just read prepared speeches written by aides and then return to their offices. Then there's Dick Durbin. On issues from immigration reform to judicial nominees, the Illinois Democrat frequently engages in public back and forth with his Senate colleagues in hearings and before votes, and rarely uses notes to do it. I wish I were as equipped as you, Senator Durbin. Of course, Senator Durbin um, has recently taken on, um, or over the last 18 months, um, a project that's very important for our nation. And I think everyone in Washington, no matter which candidate you supported, which party you are, um, has been talking about how the junior senator from Illinois has no bigger supporter or more effective advocate than Senator Durbin. Uh, but, of course, Senator Durbin has been a champion for everyone in Illinois. He's worked consistently to ensure that people's basic economic needs are met, supporting legislation to promote and preserve good jobs, including fighting to increase the minimum wage, to provide affordable housing to underserved communities, and to make sure that our nation's veterans get the benefits and need the, the care and care that they need and so richly deserve. Senator Durbin has also been a leader on issues of particular importance to the legal community, working to secure funding for a new federal courthouse in Rockford, and for the appropriation of $12 million for the U.S. Marshal Service for enhanced security for federal judges and their families. And on issues near and dear to ACS's heart, and I think truly to our democracy, this country has had no better friend than Senator Durbin. His leadership was essential in securing passage of the original language to prohibit the use of Iraq war funds to subject any person in U.S. custody to torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. He has worked tirelessly to protect the civil rights and civil liberties of all Americans and to safeguard the balance of powers that is at the core of our constitutional democracy. And finally, he has tuned his finely honed debating skills to one of the most important issues a senator ever faces, the vitally important discussion about the qualities we should look for in the men and women who are nominated to serve in our judiciary. Senator Durbin, your work is an example to all of us, and we are honored to have you here today. Thank you very much, Lisa. About that Time Magazine 10 best, there were only 90 senators who disagreed with that conclusion. What a week. What a week. Think of it. Just think of it. Both the Sox and the Cubs in first place. It's amazing. And Chicago makes the Final Four for the Olympics. And uh, Junior Senator from Illinois makes the Final Two for the presidency. It's a terrific week. I started asking judicial nominees about the Federalist Society. It was curious how they responded. I can remember one who was a professor at Georgetown and a very thoughtful man who went to the Department of Justice. And I said, tell me about this Federalist Society. What is it and why do you belong to it? He said, oh, it's a free lunch in Chinatown once a month. <laughs> really? And so I asked each one of them, and the response was not that forthcoming, but it was clear to me that this was the secret handshake of the Bush administration. If you knew, if you could put Federalist Society on your resume, you had a much better chance. Uh, being appointed to one of the highest offices in the land. That's why the work of the American Constitution Society is so important. There are many people who deserve credit for where this organization is today. Uh, I am sure one of the persons who inspired them and inspired me in public life and still does is Abner Mikva. Abner, thank you for everything you've done for me, for America.
And what a group of legal legends that you have today, honoring Lowell Sacknoff, uh, Tom Sullivan, Judge Alana Rovner, and Judge Jim Moran. They are the best. And I've been asked to extend the greetings from another legal legend. He was once a little-known state senator who taught constitutional law on the side at the University of Chicago, and today he's on to bigger and better things. I recognize that this is a 501c3 organization and cannot take political positions, nor should it. But I think we can discuss in the most general terms the positions of some elected officials on the future of the judiciary and the positions of the junior senator from Illinois and the senior senator from Arizona are quite different. John McCain was recently asked what his vision of the federal bench would be. He said his role models were John Roberts and Samuel Alito. I voted against those two nominees, and so did the junior senator from Illinois. <laughs> this, is what, this is what Senator Obama said on the floor when the vote for, Senate, for Mr. Alito came up. When you look at his record when it comes to his understanding of the Constitution, I found that in almost every case he consistently sides on behalf of the powerful against the powerless, on behalf of a strong government or corporation against upholding America's individual rights and liberties. So what would be the impact of more Supreme Court justices in the image of Justices Roberts and Alito? What would it mean for average Americans? Judge Richard Posner recently provided an answer. Judge Posner ranked the 43 justices who've served on the Supreme Court since 1937 from the most liberal to the most conservative. And where do the Bush appointments come down? And incidentally, John, Cain, John McCain's role models? Chief Justice Roberts ranks as the fourth most conservative justice since 1937, Justice Alito the fifth most conservative. The only justices of the past 71 years, by Judge Posner's calculation, with a more conservative voting record than Roberts and Alito or a few familiar names, Scalia, Thomas, and Rehnquist. We've seen the impact of these two new justices on the Supreme Court. So many five to four decisions relating to the right to pay, minority voting rights, school integration, environmental protection, consumer protection, reproductive freedom. Judge Justices Roberts and Alito were in the majority in each of these cases. Justice Breyer said in his dissent in the school integration case, quote, it is not often in the law that so few have quickly undone so much. So when their hearings came before us, each of these nominees at that time said that they would serve as neutral umpires once on the Supreme Court. They said they would just call the balls and strikes as they came across the plate. It sounded pretty good. But after seeing them in action for a few years, it appears that they are going to stretch the strike zone for the right team. It's not supposed to work that way. Jeff Stone, who's here today and will be introducing the League of Legends in a few minutes, wrote a terrific op-ed in the Chicago Tribune last month reminding us what the framers had in mind when they crafted the Constitution and created an independent judiciary to serve as the guardian of our rights and a check on overbearing majorities. I think many people have lost sight of this. They've forgotten why we created an independent ju judiciary in the first place. But the people in this room and the American Constitution Society has not forgotten, and Senator Obama has not forgotten. Thanks again for inviting me to this great lunch. Lieutenant Governor Pat Quinn, I'm glad to be on the program with you, and I thank you all for the fine work you're doing, not only in Chicago, but in law schools across America. Thank you. Um, my honor is my last time standing up here is to now turn things over to Jeff Stone, who I believe most of you know. Um, he's a member of the ACS Board of Directors, 
um, University of Chicago law professor, former dean, and former provost uh, at the University of Chicago, oft-quoted um, author, oft-quoted blogger, and well-known author of a number of both books and law reviews. Um, Jeff is going to emcee the rest of the program. Um, as some of you, as some of you may know this, but Jeff actually had he was ahead of his time and had the idea for creating an organization like ACS actually a decade before we were founded. And unfortunately, we weren't as quick as he was. Uh, it took us another 10 years to do it. But as a result, ACS has um, no stronger supporter. He's absolutely dedicated to the organization, to this chapter in particular, um, and to the mission of the organization. So uh, Jeff has been a leading intellect for decades, as I know most of you are aware, and has challenged many a student and colleague, myself included, to think harder um, and express our ideas more succinctly, advice he might have been giving, trying to give me earlier today. Um, and, but it's a skill he's clearly going to use as he tries to keep all of us on schedule for the rest of the day. So thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Lisa. Um, the American Constitution Society is unbelievably fortunate to have as its leader, Lisa Brown. I, I'd like you to join me in expressing our appreciation to her. I also want to say, Lisa earlier um, acknowledged the firm uh, sponsors of this event, but there's also one uh, institution of, of legal education in Chicago that is a sponsor of this event, and we should acknowledge them as well. John Marshall Law School is the only law school in Chicago, I'm sorry to say, um, who is a sponsor of, of this afternoon's luncheon, and I'd also like to thank John Marshall for their leadership in that regard. The American Constitution Society is about ideas. It's about important ideas. It's about the ideas of justice and fairness and equality and freedom. But it's not only about ideas. It's about putting those ideas into action. Over the past eight years, those ideas have been in exile. But that will change. And it will change in important ways that are shaped by the activities, by the events, by the debates that have been sponsored by the American Constitution Society over the past decade. ACS will play a critical role in redefining the legal system, the values of the, of the, of the courts, and of the Department of Justice in this nation. And we are very fortunate to be here and have the opportunity to participate in that effort. It is an exciting moment. It is our moment. It's your moment. And the ACS will play a pivotal role in bringing about the change that this nation needs. But to that end, ACS actively engages throughout the nation progressive lawyers, law students, judges, law professors, and citizens in the process of defining and articulating and ultimately figuring out how to implement those ideas. And the ACS chapter is one of the leaders in this organization. For those of you who have not participated in many of our events, I want to give you an example of some of the events over the past year and to assure you that we'll continue to have such events in the future and to remind you that it's important to participate in these activities so you have a voice in the articulation and definition and implementation of our future. So among the events of the past year here in Chicago were discussions of the Supreme Court's approach to discrimination, the First Amendment in the Supreme Court, 9-11 and immigration policy, the caucus and primary system, the imperial presidency, due process and Guantanamo, prayer in public schools, police oversight and police accountability, reproductive freedom and global health. In the coming year, we'll continue to have events along those lines. And again, I encourage you to participate and to add your voice to those of other citizens as we attempt to make a more progressive future. In particular, events for the summer are listed in the program, and I want to call to your attention especially an event tomorrow afternoon at Mayor Brown at 4.30 at which Yale Law School Dean Harold Coe will speak on the, on the subject of international law. Harold is one of the nation's leading experts in this field, and I'm sure it will be a lively and engaging discussion. 
My next task is to introduce our main speaker this afternoon, and this is a privilege. Lieutenant Governor Pat Quinn holds a degree in international economics from Georgetown and a law degree from Northwestern University. From early on in his career, Pat Quinn made his mark by leading grassroots efforts to challenge the interests of the wealthy and the powerful. He led petition drives to support consumer protection, tax reform, citizen empowerment, and the creation of the Illinois Citizen Utilities Board. In 2001, he walked across Illinois from the Mississippi River to Lake Michigan to raise awareness of the need to provide decent health care for all citizens. As a former aide recently remarked, Pat Quinn's instincts will always be to stir things up in the interest of reform. After practicing tax law in Chicago, Pat Quinn served as commissioner of the Cook County Board of Tax Appeals, revenue director for the city of Chicago, and Illinois State Treasurer. Then in 2002, he was elected lieutenant governor of Illinois, a position to which he was reelected in 2006. In this capacity, he led the statewide campaign to enact the Illinois Military Family Relief Act, which provides financial assistance to the families of Illinois National Guard members and reservists who have been called to active duty. And he also sponsored the Let Them Rest in Peace Act, which serves as a national model for laws protecting grieving families from disruptive protests at the funerals of servicemen and servicewomen, and does so without violating the First Amendment. Pat Quinn's continuing priorities include advocating for taxpayers and consumers, protecting the environment, promoting quality health care, and helping members of the armed services and their families. In his effort to promote a cleaner environment, he's championed sustainable and renewable energy standards, and as chair of the Illinois Green Government Council, he has actively promoted anti-pollution regulation, resource conservation, and energy efficiency. Pat Quinn is also a champion of political reform. He's consistently been a strong proponent of allowing Illinois voters to recall public officials if they are dissatisfied with their performance in office. He's argued that every public official should be accountable to the people, a position the Chicago Tribune recently praised as a most unusual example of a political leader putting principle over self-interest. It's my pleasure to introduce Lieutenant Governor Pat Quinn. Well, it's an honor to be here, and I want to thank uh, the American Constitution Society for this opportunity, and we salute the legends in our midst who are going to receive an award shortly. I think each and every one has really lived up to the goal of every lawyer to be a zealous advocate for the public interest, and that's been manifested in many different ways, and certainly the award that uh, Colleen received uh, a moment ago, I think... Uh, it's very, very relevant, too, that we realize here in the 21st century that law is evolving, and it's very important to honor those who are on the cutting edge of law. And I do want to also thank Senator Durbin, who's been a very strong voice for fundamental rights in the United States Senate over and over again in his career as both a congressman and now a senator, making sure that not only the members of the judiciary respect the Constitution, uh, but that we get the kind of laws passed in Washington that adhere to the Constitution in the first place. And we have to have senators who stand up at times against the tides of uh, pundits and uh, cable TV shows and so on to do the right thing by America. And I also want to acknowledge uh, my very close friend, uh, someone who I have admired all my life, uh, Judge Abner Mikva, who I had the honor of sitting next to at lunch. Uh, when I was going to Georgetown University, I volunteered for Congressman Mikva's uh, office and uh, learned a great deal from Congressman Mikva about how to get along with people and how to stand up for important uh, rights. And um, I have always admired his good work. Um, his uh, daughter, Mary, went to law school with me at Northwestern Law School. I see the clock has Northwestern over here at the University Club and hopefully we can get Northwestern Law School to join the uh, sponsorship of the American uh, Constitution Society. We have to work on that. Um, I thought today, I know there are many, many issues at the federal level that uh, are ex extremely important, especially after the eight years of the Bush administration. And I think some of the previous speakers have outlined the 
important issues that we must deal with at the federal level with the united states supreme court as well as the federal congress and our new president and i think that's important that we always keep that in mind but i in my life have always worked at the state level state of illinois one of the largest states in the union uh... the home of abraham lincoln indeed we're the land of lincoln and i think it's important for all of those who believe in fairness and making sure that we have constitutions that grow and are, are dynamic and move with the times to always keep in mind that state constitutions are very important as well and uh, i think if you look at recent history uh, a number of lawyers have uh, done research and found that uh, oftentimes the history and text of state constitutions including uh, text on fundamental liberties like speech and assembly and religion uh, petition uh, not, are not identical to the text of the First Amendment and oftentimes state constitutions have broader rights that are that are contained in the federal constitution for example Illinois does have in our state constitution a broader right of privacy express mention of privacy in our constitution and we also in 1970 enacted an environmental article into our constitution that says that every person has a fundamental right to a healthful environment and it's the duty of every person to provide and maintain for a healthful environment for this and future generations so it isn't really just the role of government to fight for a healthful environment for everyone it's really every person's right and uh, duty and it also is not just for our time but for future generations now that doesn't exist at the federal level and I think it is important to see that states are the laboratory of democracy and it is an opportunity for progressive minded people and those who are concerned about making sure the law is fair and just uh, to look at state constitutions as a uh, place where we can expand the law and move the law in a positive direction and I made a list today of some of the issues that come up it's particularly relevant in Illinois this year because our state like about 16 or 17 other states around the country have automatic provisions in their existing constitution that every 10 years or in our case uh, every 20 years there's a referendum automatically on the ballot asking the voters whether or not there should be a constitutional convention convened to look at the constitution uh, indeed you could rewrite the entire document or as an alternative you could propose specific amendments to the existing constitution we had this referendum in 1988 in Illinois it was uh, rejected by the voters but this year 2008 a very important year with the election of president and US senator in our state we also on the ballot right at the top of the ballot will be asked as a people in Illinois the voters will decide whether or not to call a constitutional convention and I fear that sometimes people who uh, believe uh, in a progressive way of thinking uh, are fearful of a constitutional convention and I think that that uh, debate ought to take place it ought to be robust and I'm sure there will be people on both sides of the question I happen to favor a constitutional convention as the only way to allow new ideas and fresh people to take a look at important issues in our state but separate and distinct from my point of view I think looking at American history this is a book called American Scripture it was written a few years ago uh, by an interesting author who took a look at the Declaration of Independence which I'm very happy to say the American Constitution Society has provided us with a copy of the Declaration of Independence the Constitution of the United States of America and the Gettysburg Address so I think in we if we look at the history of the Declaration of Independence in American scripture I think most of us uh, kind of think that it was Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin and maybe John Adams uh, in a room there in Philadelphia kind of writing it out uh, and indeed that did happen but prior to that there were 90 different places and units of government in our country uh, that ad adopted their own declarations of independence indeed there were conventions that were convened in the then 13 colonies where people on their own uh, wanted to instruct the delegates to the Continental Congress to 
tell King George that we were tired of tyranny and we wanted a democracy, the first one on planet Earth. And it was ordinary people uh, sort of adopting this American political invention of a convention or a gathering uh, to come together to instruct uh, what uh, the Continental uh, Congress delegates ought to do. And I think that was, uh, I think, emblematic of American democracy, that we oftentimes see a special gathering of people as necessary to break the gridlock and break the status quo and conventional wisdom, uh, to let the ordinary people have their say on important issues of the day. And as a result, many of our states around the country, including Illinois, have this requirement, kind of following Thomas Jefferson's view that if every generation, every 20 years, there ought to be a re-examination of uh, fundamental documents and structures that guide us. Uh, I think that's uh, something that's healthy in our state and will occur in our state. And I think the American Constitution Society should take a strong role in encouraging debate on our Illinois Constitution. Uh, I even brought that today. Here's the, part, the Illinois Constitution is here, and I thought some of the things that ought to be looked at because they pertain not only to our state but really the whole country. When you think about it, in 1988, the last time this vote occurred in Illinois, the internet didn't exist. It hadn't been invented yet by Al Gore or the University of Illinois. Uh, it uh, was something that was not really. Uh, part of our lives until really about a, 10 years ago, a little bit more maybe. Uh, and I, it seems to me that what are the implications for fundamental rights of an Internet information-based society? There are very important privacy rights that uh, at the federal level, uh, the right of privacy is not expressly mentioned. It has been found in various other mentions in the federal constitution. But I do think that the states ought to take a leadership role in their state constitutions about the right of privacy and about our rights with respect to uh, an internet world, a broadband world. Does everyone have a right to high-speed internet? Uh, are we going to have a two-tier society where some people are in and other people are not? Uh, I think that's uh, something that we need a healthy debate on. Same thing goes with respect to health care. I was with my doctor, uh, Quentin Young who uh, has recently retired from the practice of medicine, but is hardly a retiring person. And Dr. Young and I uh, walked across Illinois in 2001 from Rock Island on the Mississippi River to uh, Chicago over here on Lake Michigan. And we walked on behalf of the Bernadine Amendment, named after Cardinal Bernadine of our state and our city, uh, who just before he passed away, lamented the fact that our country uh, failed to have in its uh, uh, fundamental documents a right of health care, a fundamental right to decent health care for everyone, not the right of access, the right of health care for everyone. And so we actually took uh, two sentences from his last pastoral letter, Cardinal Bernadine's letter, to all of us, uh, and we uh, put them in a constitutional amendment for the state of Illinois called the Bernadine Amendment that we in our state would have a fundamental right to decent health care for everyone. Seems to me we, anyone who's progressive needs to think about that. We can't have a society where uh, some people are left out of health care. We believe in everybody in, nobody left out. So the right of health care is something that I think um, has to be carefully looked at, just like education. In our own state, we have an education article in the Constitution, which is, I think, a good thing. Unfortunately, in the 40 years or so that it's been in the Constitution, it's sort of uh, been interpreted by our courts as more an admonition or a hortatory statement that everyone has a fundamental right uh, to uh, education to the fullest extent of their ability. The way it's been financed in Illinois, uh, our Constitution says that the state of Illinois has the primary responsibility for funding elementary and secondary schools. But the courts have held that that is not a right that can be used by a taxpayer to make sure that the state of Illinois indeed is paying at least half the cost of elementary and secondary education in Illinois. So that's another area, whether it's privacy or health care or education. These are fundamental things that affect all of us. 
And as I said, we have an environmental article in our Constitution, but again, it doesn't empower the citizens, in my opinion, enough to take direct action when they see an environmental hazard. I think the most form formidable challenge of our time is to have a green way of thinking and a green way of acting. We must be a sustainable society. It's an imperative for our planet and for all of us. It doesn't take too long for, I think, everyday people to see $4 a gallon gasoline and realize that we're going to have to change our ways. And I think, again, our constitutions have to deal with the practical economic realities that all of us uh, face. And with respect to our environment and sustainability, uh, we must have, I think, uh, uh, mention of that in the Constitution and also ways for the people to act. I think the purpose of constitutions are into, not to empower the government and to those who hold power in the government, but rather the fundamental purpose of a constitution is to empower the people. The constitution belongs to the everyday people who live from paycheck to paycheck. They're the heart and soul of America. Their sons and daughters are serving in our military and defending our fundamental rights and our democracy. And I think that uh, in my judgment, I've been at this for some time. Uh, somebody calculated over the years that I've collected over four million signatures on petitions with many other people helping out. And I do believe that in our state and other places as well, we need more opportunities for voters to express themselves, to not just stand on the sidelines, but to use 21st century information technology to have an opportunity to vote on issues at the local and state level. Uh, some states have that, many of them do, but not our state here in Illinois. Uh, the states of Wisconsin and Michigan, Minnesota and Kansas and 18 other states have the right of recall where if after the election a office holder uh, is uh, breaking promises, is behaving in a way that is totally uh, in not meeting the approval of the voters, uh, those states have the opportunity to use a democratic process petition and recall election to uh, address the situation. Uh, there is also in, in the state of uh, Massachusetts an interesting direct democracy power where the voters don't necessarily put something on the ballot, but they can gather a certain number of signatures for a law they think is necessary and require the House and Senate of uh, Massachusetts to take a roll call vote on that particular issue. In our own state, I can tell you from my own experience, and especially in the last few years, uh, where gridlock is uh, oftentimes the rule of the day, important issues are decided by one or two leaders who decide whether or not a vote will take place. And I think that's not a healthy thing at all for our democracy. And it relates to the old issue of districting and redistricting and reapportionment. Uh, we don't want a system in America or in the land of Lincoln where the politicians choose their voters. And that oftentimes happens with redistricting. The politicians, together with technical experts, draw the lines in such a way as to limit competition. And that isn't healthy. It's much better to have a system of districting where there is true competition and the voters get to choose their elected officials. So all of these, in my opinion, are constitutional issues. I think also we should look at the fact that a number of state Supreme Courts have interpreted their rights of speech and assembly and petition to be broader than the federal uh, constitution and especially that as interpreted by our U.S. Supreme Court. If we don't like the U.S. Supreme Court and we're saddled uh, with justices like Chief Justice Roberts and Scalia and uh, the others, uh, then maybe we should look at state courts to expand and defend rights. And uh, that happened, for example, in California famous case called Prune Yard, where the state Supreme Court there said the right of speech and assembly allowed citizens at shopping malls to have conversations about their democracy. Uh, that doesn't exist, that right, at the federal level, the federal constitution, it does exist, at least in some states. Uh, having said all this, uh, as I mentioned, you brought, I think, to all of us the uh, opportunity to carry this in our pocket, the Declaration of Independence 
and the uh, Constitution of uh, the United States of America and the Gettysburg Address that is written there on the Lincoln Memorial, on the wall of the memorial. This is really the owner's manual for the people of our country uh, and for all of us. Uh, we are the owners of our democracy. The greatest gift God has ever given us is the opportunity to have a democracy. And I think we need to use that in a way that makes changes that are necessary uh, to help uh, advance justice and fairness. And uh, I think we should remember the words of Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg in 1863, at the dedication of a national cemetery. It's only 272 words long, the Gettysburg Address. And it says, government of the people, and by the people, and for the people, it shall not perish from the earth. That's what Lincoln said then. It's true today. I went to a funeral this week of a young soldier from Rockford, Illinois, Blake Evans, Sergeant Blake Evans, who truly believed those words, who right after high school volunteered for our army and served in Iraq, not once but twice, gave his life for our democracy. He truly believed in Lincoln's words. I think we do as well. And together with all of us, the American Constitution Society and the people of Illinois, we can make the will of the people the law of the land. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor Quinn. I, before we turn to the acknowledgement and celebration of our legal legends, I want to thank the host committee uh, who's responsible for uh, putting this event uh, together today. Uh, they've done a wonderful job. And so I'd like to acknowledge uh, Amy Gardner, Barry Sullivan, the Chicago Kent College of Law, which, as it turns out, joins John Marshall Law School and I'm serving on the host committee. So we've moved from one to two law schools just like that. David Mel Melton, Jack Tice, Jamie Stevens, the Jewish Judges Association of Illinois, Kroll, leading lawyers, Mario Sullivan, Megan Pitts, the Honorable Peter Flynn, Reed Smith, Ruth Goldman, Sunshine Nath and Rosenthal, and Steve Sanders, all of whom um, have made today's event possible, and we're very grateful to, your, to you for your hard work. Um, now it's time to turn to the main focus of this uh, afternoon's event, which is the uh, celebration of four individuals who have made enormous contributions to the law and to justice, uh, both in the state of Illinois and nationally. Um, each of us in this room uh, should aspire someday to receive this award. Um, if we lead our lives and our careers with that in mind, we will do an awful lot of good for an awful lot of people. Um, and so uh, it's really quite wonderful to have the opportunity uh, to say thank you to these four individuals for everything they have done uh, for all of us. Uh, Judge James Moran received his law degree, magna cum laude, from Harvard Law School in 1957. Um, after serving as a law clerk to Judge Edward Lombard of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, he joined the Chicago law firm of Bell, Boyd & Lloyd, where he became a brilliant litigator, along with Av Mikva, who seems to be getting a lot of attention today, Paul Simon and Adlai Stevenson III and others. Uh, Judge Moran was one of the infamous young Turks elected to the Illinois legislature in 1964. Uh, Ad Mikva once recalled that shortly after entering the Illinois House, Judge Moran co-sponsored a bill that was strongly opposed by the fearsome Mayor Richard J. Daley. At the time, Mikva thought that Jim Moran was either very naive or very brave. Over the years, Mikva learned, and I quote, that Jim Moran is not naive at all. He is quite simply courageous. In a similar vein, Adlai Stevenson aptly observed that Jim Moran has an unusually highly developed social conscience. In 1979, President Jimmy Carter appointed Jim Moran to the United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois, where he served with great distinction for almost 30 years. Throughout his judicial career, Judge Moran has maintained his commitment to the rule of law, his aspiration to do justice, and his exemplary social conscience. Judge Moran, a legal legend.
Well, the late uh, federal judge Fred Marshall and I had a, uh, <clears throat> a fundamental disagreement about one issue. He thought that uh, the best job in town was being baseball commissioner. He was fanatic about baseball. I wasn't. So that uh, I thought the best job in town was being a federal judge, trial judge. He thought that was only the second best job. Uh, and it has been really a pleasure, a great pleasure to serve for the last 29 years as a federal judge. With all due deference to uh, Alana, uh, I, I sit as a designated judge on courts of appeals on occasion, and I do so only enough to remind myself <clears throat> that I have a much better job. Uh, but uh, it is a situation where uh, we're kind of the last of the, uh, the generalists uh, on any level as judges as, or as lawyers. Um, we deal with real live people with real live problems in order to resolve them. And that certainly is, from my perspective, our fundamental job. Uh, as I, uh, and, and we play a particular role. Uh, as, I, as I tell uh, uh, groups when they come through for naturalization, I invariably refer to them as people who are joining with us in a continuation of the grand experiment. Uh, at the time of the creation of this country, there was no other, no predicate at all for what people were attempting to do. Uh, and here we are well over a century later, uh, and uh, close to two centuries later, uh, three, getting there. <laughs> Math was never one of my strong points. Uh, and uh, um, where uh, we are the country with the longest uh, history of a representative democracy and a written constitution. Uh, when nobody believed that it could continue in this sprawling, continental, diverse country uh, that we were and that we continue to be. Uh, I, and I subscribe to two thoughts on that. One is uh, political transparency that, uh, uh, well, I'll just take example of presidential uh, politics. Uh, uh, if you get it wrong one year, four years later, uh, you get another chance at it. And if you blow that one, uh, you get another chance four years after that. Uh, and uh, uh, at the same time, if you have two people who have a dispute about something, or an institution, or a group, uh, and uh, they're at, at odds ends as to how to accomplish something, uh, they don't have to go at each other with uh, uh, pistols and knives and machetes or anything else. Uh, they can go all into court. Uh, and uh, somebody's going to ultimately, if it goes all the way through, uh, is going to lose, but there is uh, at least a, uh, the opportunity to be heard, to have your say, to make your arguments, uh, and to have a decision made one way or the other. Uh, I, I look over this room and I see all these people who are judges and lawyers. Uh, you know, in a sim very simplistic society, we're talking about a plaintiff, a defendant, uh, and a uh, judge. Uh, it's kind of a three-legged stool. Uh, we all have our roles to play, uh, and it's in playing those roles that we work out our, our, our difficulties and, and go on as a, as a society. And uh, so it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, not only have this opportunity to serve, uh, to have the fun of serving, and it continues to be that, uh, and to be a uh, living legend besides. Uh, so uh, thank you, and uh, well, just thank you. Thank you, Jim. I have to say, as a lifelong hockey fan, my idea of the best job was goal judge. Um, little different. Uh, born in Riga, Latvia, a very young Alana Diamond Rovner and her mother fled Europe in 1939 on the eve of the Nazi invasion. Judge Rovner recalls that as a child she 
was never read stories like Little Red Riding Hood, but was told how if the laws had been followed, the horrendous things that happened to her family and to millions of others never would have happened. Judge Rovner never forgot the lessons of that injustice. After graduating from Chicago Kent College of Law in 1966, Judge Rovner became an assistant U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Illinois. Several years later, she became deputy governor and legal counsel to Illinois Governor James Thompson. In that role, she led the effort to create the Illinois Human Rights Commission. In 1994, she was appointed a federal district judge, and eight years later, she was appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals, the first woman ever to sit on the Seventh Circuit. Throughout her career, Judge Robner's opinions have reflected the values of fairness, due process, and individual freedom. In a recent decision, she overturned a judgment against an alleged terrorist organization, boldly declaring that we must resist the temptation to gloss over error, simply decide with our government against the face of terrorism. Judge Robner, thank you for that sentiment and for everything you've done for the law in Illinois and nationally. I know a secret. <laughs> the reason that uh, Jim Moran has the best job is because Jim Moran is the best judge. <laughs> a day does not pass when my parents of blessed memory are not on my mind. But since the letter arrived with the news of this singular honor, they have been in my thoughts constantly. So please allow me to take you back to 1952 when another letter arrived. And my mother and I learned that a date had been set for her to take the citizenship examination. My father had already passed the test and had been sworn in as a United States citizen. But because my mother and I emigrated from Latvia at a later date, we were still aliens. The citizenship test is the only test I have literally ever yearned to take. But that was not a possibility. I was brought into the United States on my mother's passport, and so only she was allowed to take the exam. We had waited with intense anticipation for this day. Indeed, Words alone could never explain how deep was our desire to become American citizens, to truly belong to this great nation that had saved our lives. World War II took an unspeakable toll on us. My parents lost almost all of their immediate families to the Nazis, and the years that followed were somber and difficult ones. As a result, poring over texts and history books and concentrating on the details of American history was very difficult for my grieving mother. And so, night after night, and week after week, and month after month, I tutored my mother in the history of the United States and its legal foundations. Every fact that I learned in my history and civics classes in high school, I brought home to her. We studied the Bill of Rights and the Constitution until we both could recite whole passages by heart. 
I came to love each and every word written in those sacred documents, and I have never stopped loving them. And those words have served as the touchstone for my life and my career. And so I thank you for this great honor and for the work that you have undertaken to make those remarkable words continue to live and breathe the literal mainspring of all that is best in our society. And I thank you for giving me the opportunity to revisit the memory of that special and formative time in my life spent with my beloved mother, to whom I owe, along with so much else, my citizenship. It'll be hard to follow. <laughs> like Judge Moran, Lowell Sacknoff received his law degree from Harvard in 1957. The son of Ukrainian Jewish parents who fled Eastern Europe to escape persecution, Lowell has devoted his life to protecting the civil rights of the poor, the disenfranchised, and the most vulnerable members of society. Lowell left private practice in the early 1960s, for example, to serve as general counsel for the Illinois Department of Mental Health, where he spearheaded reforms to protect the rights of the mentally ill. In 1969, he helped found the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. In the 1980s, he won a landmark jury verdict against the city of Chicago, declaring unlawful its policy of allowing police officers to strip search women for minor traffic stops. In the 1990s, he served as lead counsel in litigation that produced a nationwide injunction against forcible blockades of women's health clinics. And today, he represents a prisoner in Guantanamo Bay who's been held, in Lowell's words, in a legal black hole for more than five years. Throughout his career, Lowell has dedicated himself to fulfilling Dean Irwin Griswold's advice to his Harvard Law students more than half a century ago. Those of you who have been privileged to receive a fine legal education, he said, have an obligation to make our law more just and more equitable. And that's precisely what Lowell has done. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. There's an old adage that's goes that you're known by the company that you keep. And that being said, if I had a magic wand, I couldn't create a better company of honorees than the American Constitution Society has put me together with. It's a little bit, if some of you who were at uh, the ACLU when Tony Lewis said it was like being in a warm bath. Uh, but it's like that. And as I look around and I, I look at the co-honorees, I see that there are no better no wiser, no more compassionate judges than Alana Rovner and Jim Moran, two old friends, and in Jim's case, a neighbor and law school classmate. My respect for judges Rovner and Moran usually reached its peak when they ruled against me, which they did fairly often, and in the course of doing so, they were able to persuade me that I was probably wrong. And Tom Sullivan, he reminded me that one of the main reasons I have a law license was to join him in representing prisoners at Guantanamo in that legal black hole down there. And in thinking about the work that Colleen Connell does every day, every day of her life, and the mission of the American Constitution Society, I'm reminded of what Harry Blackman said at his confirmation hearing 
when he was asked about his constitutional philosophy, and I might add that wherever Alito and Rehnquist and Thomas and Scalia are on that curve of conservatives, Harry Blackman would be at the opposite end, and our country is thankful for that. But when he was asked about his philosophy, Blackman steered through those really dangerous waters by pledging that his constitutional decisions, and I want to quote him exactly, he said, would not be affected by his personal philosophy, but rather he would construe that instrument in the light of what he felt is its definite and determined meaning, close quote. However, his very next sentence was, but of course, many times this is obscure. <laughs> it's um, in those wonderful vineyards of constitutional obscurity that in the same way as Justice Blackmun, Colleen Connell and the American Constitution Society labor every day, every day, to ensure that basic principles of human dignity, individual rights, this is really the ACS's mission, individual rights and liberties, genuine equality, and access to justice enjoy their rightful and central place in American law. I'm honored to be in the larger company here of Lieutenant Governor Quinn, Jeff Stone, and Lisa Brown. And so I thank you, thank you for this honor, and to expand on that just a bit, I thank you very much. I got one of these. Okay. Since Lowell mentioned Justice Blackmun, I'm going to take a point of privilege and tell you a story about Justice Blackmun, because I think it explains a lot about him and why he was not down there with Scalia and Thomas and Rehnquist and Roberts and Alito, and why he was, by the end of his career, among those with Brennan and Marshall. Um, I, I was a law clerk to Justice Brennan in 1972-73, the year of Roe versus Wade. Um, and after that decision, the two justices who received by far the most hate mail uh, were Justices Brennan, because he was Catholic, and Justice Blackmun, because he was the author of the opinion. Um, and Brennan took the view that he would not read any of this mail, that it was inappropriate, that it had nothing to do with his responsibilities as a justice, and, and he wouldn't take a look at it. Uh, but Justice Blackmun, on the other hand, really felt the need uh, to allow himself to feel uh, what the reaction of people was. And, and one, late one night, um, I was in the Supreme Court building, and I went to Blackman's chambers to um, talk to one of his law clerks about a totally different matter. And nobody was there but Justice Blackman. And he was sitting um, in his office. All the lights were out except a green reading light on his desk. And there was a, a stack of these letters piled up there neatly, one on top of the next. And he was sitting with his reading glasses down over his nose. And he was 2 in the morning reading these letters. Um, and I'm absolutely convinced that it was at that moment that Harry Blackman uh, moved from being a Nixon appointee conservative to being the justice he became, that he came to understand what it meant to be an outcast and what it meant to be someone who was not in the mainstream of society. Um, and that fundamentally changed his outlook on the law um, and on his role as a justice. And it's, it's too bad that some of the other justices can't suffer in the same way. <clears throat> But it also proves we are capable of learning, and that's important. Um, Tom Sullivan graduated from Loyola University School of Law in 1952. In Tom's own words, I've always had a penchant for the underdog. In the 1990s, Tom courageously represented Jeremiah Stamler against the House Un-American Activities Committee. Several years later, he won a landmark victory in the U.S. Supreme Court in Witherspoon versus Illinois in which the court held that prosecutors cannot constitutionally exclude potential jurors simply because they oppose the death penalty. He represented thousands of African-American homeowners in the Contract Buyers League case. And he represented the defense lawyers who had themselves represented Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, and other defendants in the Conspiracy 7 trial, which of course arose out of the 1968 Democratic Convention. As U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois, Tom initiated Operation Greylord, which resulted in the convictions of 15 judges for corruption. 
More recently, Thomas played a critical role in the death penalty debate in Illinois, co-chairing Governor Ryan's Commission on Capital Punishment, Northwestern University Law School Center on Wrongful Convictions, and chairing the State of Illinois Death Penalty Reform Study Commission, on which I have a privilege of serving. Like Lowell Sacknoff, Tom Sullivan currently represents individuals who are being held in Guantanamo Bay, a situation he has quite aptly described as a national disgrace. Please join me in congratulating Tom Sullivan. make one correction to uh, <clears throat> that introduction. Uh, I argued the Witherspoon case in the Supreme Court of Illinois where it was lost. Uh, Burt Jenner argued it in the Supreme Court of the United States and I went with him and sat with him during the argument. Two nights before the argument he took me to the University Club in Washington, D.C., and we went in the men's uh, steam room, unclothed, and in walks a white-haired man, and Bert gets up and says, Chief, how are you? Hey, Bert. It was Chief Justice Warren. <laughs> and two days later, I saw Warren kind of peering down at me, and uh, Bert gets a letter after the argument from Warren saying that during the... Uh, post-argument conference, he mentioned that he remembered during the argument having met me in the steam room, and one of the other judges says that the Supreme Court of the United States has come to a hell of a pass when the Supreme Court Chief Justice can't recognize the lawyers in front of them when they've got their clothes on. <laughs> According to my Webster's, if there's a story that's lost in the mist of history and no longer verifiable, but widely believed, that's a legend. <laughs> and it sounds old, actually. <laughs> but all I would like to say on this occasion is that whatever um, has been accomplished is not accomplished alone. And so I'd like to acknowledge a few of the people in my career and my life. Many of these names you won't know, but they mean a lot to me. First of all, my dear secretary for many years, Mary Cole, and my present secretary, Joe Stafford. Where are you, Joe? Way over there. Burt Jenner, Prentice Marshall, and Jeff Coleman. Where are you, Jeff? Three who are no longer with us, Al Metz, John Stifler, and Edward Lewis. My wife, Ann Landau, who, by the way, her father, Rabbi Moses Landau, escaped from Austria in uh, the late 30s and came to the United States just in time. His mother and sister were killed in ostrich. My children, Maggie, Tim, and Liza, and my four grandchildren. Greg Jones, who served as my first assistant when I was U.S. Attorney. And my partners at Jenner and Block. Thank you very much to the American Constitution Society for this honor. Thank you all very much for coming. Now it's time to follow the lead of our legal legends and roll up our sleeves and put some good ideas into action. Thank you.